Amen, 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 amen. It's great to be with you. You may be seated. Thank you again, Brother Tenney. And God bless you. We certainly give honor to Brother Tenney, Sister Tenney, on this night when they're celebrating and being honored for their 15 years of leadership. And let me say, not only here in the Louisiana district has their leadership been felt, but truly around the world. You would have to say that Brother and Sister Tenney's influence has reached around the world many times and hearts and lives have been inspired because of their great witness and preaching and, and all the little things they do that uh, only eternity will be able to tell the story of the thousands of little ways that they have touched the lives of people along with the great ways. And thank you for letting us be here to the district board, to all of our special guests and ministers and to our friends and of course to our Assistant General Superintendent, Brother Kilgore, thank you, and thank you for that lesson today. And Brother Grisham, thank you again for preaching to us so marvelously. It's a joy. Amen. And Brother Tim Pettico, thank you for preaching with me last night. My goodness. I wish you'd just come and preach again tonight. Amen. God bless you. Worship with Brother Tim. He's going to sing for us here. And he wrote a song a few years ago that well, it really is one of my favorite songs, and it's a great song, and the words of which we need to all pay real close attention. Keep believing. When troubles rise, catch you on the way. The day-to-day -day of living seems unfair keep believing the enemy can only bring defeat if he can somehow shake what we believe so our faith Cannot be based upon only what we see or feel, and the circumstances cannot change what our hearts know to be real. So when doubts arise, cloud your mind, my friend, don't be deceived, for with the knowledge of the word I Stand with me for the reading of the word. John chapter 14, verse number 6. Thank you, Louisiana, for your wonderful hospitality. We have 
felt so very welcome here, and I'm delighted. I, I, I hung my apron up on the sprinkler system in the hotel. I'm really proud of that. I was tempted to even wear it here tonight to preach in it. I was so proud of it. But Sister Mooney talked me out of it. John chapter 14, verse number 6. Now watch what Jesus does in verse number 6. He takes all the neutrality out of this whole thing. To think about what I'm saying. He takes all the neutrality out of the whole thing. People are facing this book today as if they had a choice. Jesus gave you no choice. He gave you no options. Which in one sense may seem like a very terrible thing, but if you spend a little time with that idea, that's a, a fantastic gift that Jesus Christ gave to the human race. Just took you right to the bottom line. Took you straight to the period. Looked you in the eye and said you have no choice. And of course they hated him for it then. They hate him for it now. And they hate us for reminding them of this great truth. But here it is. Let's read it. Verse number six. Read with me now. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let's, let's do it again. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let's pray. God, in your precious name, anoint the word. Help us to receive tonight the things that you would speak to our hearts through your preached word. We need your anointing and your touch. We thank you for this great service, for everything that's happened, every testimony, every expression, every song. Thank you for this great choir that's traveled here from Houston. Bless these young people. Thank you for this wonderful day. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody say, I have no choice. Now poke the person beside you and say, paddle or die. You say that's a choice. Well, only if you want to die is it a choice. You may be seated. Cannot drift. You know what? I worry a little bit about the church. Not the church in the sense of the purchased body of Jesus Christ, but some people who claim to be in the church is the ones I worry about, who think that they can drift or think that they can be neutral. There is no neutrality. We used to have one preacher that would come by our church every once in a while and he would say, either you is or either you ain't. There's no neutrality. You've got to decide. Somebody said, I will decide to do nothing. But you've made a decision nevertheless because even if you decide not to decide, you've decided not to decide. You can't drift. And Jesus brings you right to the bottom line. Now, I find that one of the most fascinating things that Jesus ever discussed is in John chapter 15 where he brought up the ultimate subject. He brings up the idea. He says, what if I had not come? He knew, of course, that he did not have to come. But he brings this up. He says, what if I had not come? And he answers it really he's, he, he, by, by reminding them, well, maybe, or if I had not come, then we wouldn't have had.
had, I wouldn't have imposed on the human race the sin problem, but if I had not brought up the problem of sin, then everyone would have died in their sins. So there's no, there's no option here. There's no choice. In a sense, he had to come or we would have died. An interesting uh, book was recently pub published by uh, a man by the name of Bloom. And it's called American Religion. It's not an easy book to read. It's a tough read, but it's fascinating in this sense. He says that there are three main religions who are going to be very active and probably will dominate the religious scene in the next 20 years. And he names these three groups as the Baptists, the Mormons, and the Pentecostals. And he says of those three groups, the group that has the most potential to really affect the world are the Pentecostals. But he went on to tell us that the problem with the Pentecostals is their unwillingness to make an honest commitment to dealing with the problems. They tend to drift. Now, folks, we are in such a critical time, in my opinion, that we cannot afford even one more day of drifting. Some of you haven't fully decided yet if you're going to get behind the church, if you're going to get behind the preacher, if you're going to get with the program. You can't afford to drift even one more day. The clock is ticking. We're running out of time. Jesus just takes all the mystery out of this. He said, look at it this way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There are no options. Now, I know you can't force people to do right. You can't force people to accept Christ, but you certainly can tell them of their responsibility. And Christ said that if we would tell this world, if we would lift him up, that he would draw all men unto him. Now, sometimes I get a, a, a spirit on me where, and I would like to just, you know, knock people over with this. I don't know if you've ever met anybody, you just kind of wanted to hit them with a ball bat. And, uh, but I feel that way. We had a, a gal in our church one time and I was having problems with a teenager. And uh, he had given me so much problem and I couldn't deal with him and he was cutting up and I had just uh, tried to, to be nice to him and finally, in, uh, and he was really out, I mean extremely out of order. And so in my frustration, I walked back to him and I said, would you straighten up? And he smarted off to me and I grabbed him by the back of the neck and I pulled him up out of the seat, walked him to the door, kicked open the door and threw him out of the church. Walked back to the pulpit and tried to keep preaching. The good news of that story is that young man became one of the finest Christians. He called me, he called me not too long ago, Mickey, and he said, I'll never forget the night you threw me out of the church. You changed my life. If I thought I could help you, I'd just kick you right in the right place. But unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. But on the way home that night, after I had thrown out this young man, there was an, uh, an elderly lady that we took home every night. We took her home from church almost every night. And when I was taking her home on this particular night, she said to me, she said, Brother Mooney, I, I want you to know that you shouldn't take anything off those teenagers like that. I said, well, Luna, and uh, you know, I was trying not to, you know, get upset with that. She said, well, I'll tell you what, if they give you any trouble next week, I'll blow their brains out. And I looked through the rear view mirror and she had a police pistol, a 38 police pistol. And I said, Luna, where did you get that gun? She says, I carry this gun with me all the time. And said, if those teenagers give you any problem next week, I'm going to blow their brains out. I said, Luna, is that gun loaded? She said, it's always loaded. 
I said, do you have a permit for that gun? She said, I don't need a permit for this gun. I said, well, what if the sheriff came out and demanded a permit for that gun? She said, I'll blow his brains out too. She said, I'm an American and I got a constitutional right to carry this gun. Now, Luna was, well, we called her, her real name was Luna, but some of the folks in the church called her Looney. Yeah. <laughs> kind of Luna Looney. She used to do strange things in the church. Like sometimes after we had made the announcement, she would stand up and she would say, now what time was that again? And we'd been starting church at the same time for 49 years, 630 or when we took up the offering after everybody had marched, we usually marched by for the offering after we had marched by for the offering and everybody had given. Here come Luna, always a little bit late with her $2. And she, even after the ushers would go back, she'd come up and she'd be looking for the ushers. Where's the ushers? Wanting to give her $2. And the folks never did know. Some people would say, how come you put up with so much from that old lady? I said, just let me handle this old lady, all right? Because you don't know what she's got in her pocketbook, I know. It's my duty to protect the congregation. But if Luna could, she would have blowed their brains out or she would have taken a machine gun if she had had enough money to buy one and brought people to the altar that way. But you can't do it that way, as you know. It takes more than that. It takes something else. And the Lord Jesus Christ has given us the gospel, this wonderful empowerment, this wonderful message that can change men's life. But we simply cannot afford to go to sleep. This is no time to play games. We're in a life and death struggle here. Somebody help me preach. I got a little, I want to make a little challenge to you tonight. Are we going to evangelize our world? Are we going to reach the lost? Are we going to do the work of God in these last days? This church has a splendid opportunity to make an impact upon our communities, upon the lives of people, but we cannot afford to sleep. Let me tell you about the cultural war. Somebody is going to win this war. Somebody is going to have an influence. Somebody is going to have an impact. The president of Purdue University said two or three years ago at the commencement exercise, and it was a shocking statement. Because at Purdue University, they train, for the most part, people involved in agriculture, involved in all kinds of scientific experiments. And a great deal of what you see done in outer space originates Purdue University, a great engineering school in Indiana. And he got up at the commencement exercises and he said, I know I probably shouldn't say this, but if I was a young man to live my life over, I would either be a philosopher, a preacher, or a theologian. The place went silent. Everybody was stunned. How could this great educator of a wonderful engineering school, a wonderful scientific school, say that he would want to be a philosopher, a minister, or um, uh, a theologian? How could he say that? And then he went on to explain. He said, the world is changing so rapidly. Everything is moving so fast that somebody has got to influence this world in the right direction. He said science will not influence this world. It's the ministers and the theologians that will determine how the world will go. What a shock. Come on, Pentecostals. We have got a job to do that is important to this entire society. Jesus took us right to the bottom line. He said, you go out and tell this world that I am the way, the truth, and the life. There are no options. There's nothing else that can save men except the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't have to look for anyone else. The Savior has already come. The Redeemer has already come. And He has a name that is above every name. Does anybody know what His name is? This world really doesn't have much to offer. You do know that's true, don't you? 
Jesus didn't leave you guessing. He didn't say, well, there might be something else that would be good for you. He didn't say, I'm all right for some folks and not so all right for other folks. He just took you right to that wonderful bottom line and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to be saved. There's no way to uh, appropriate salvation except through my name. But this world holds out so much that's empty and frivolous. I learned this lesson. You know how... How boring the world can really be. It just kind of hit me not too long ago when I was uh, p privileged to speak at the funeral of, of uh, Sister Merrick who passed away not long ago. And, and uh, after the funeral that night and Brother Kilgore was there, was in the hotel and um, it was uh, Duluth, Minnesota, all due respect, just kind of rolls up the sidewalk uh, late at night, six, like five o'clock, real late. And... Um, there was nothing to do and it was about six and Sister Mooney was tired and she had gone in the hotel and she was snoring. The room literally, folks, sounded like a train was going. And I had a little book out and I was trying to read and she was over there just riding a train. I don't know where you was going, but the all engines were full blast. And I love my wife, but I couldn't stand it anymore that night. And I just said, I got to get out of here. This is driving me crazy. And I started walking on the streets of Duluth, Minnesota. And there was a taxi cab driver, and he was parked along the side of the road. The streets were dead. The lights were down. All the stores were closed. And the taxi cab driver was just sound asleep with his head leaning up against the glass of his automobile. And I tapped on the car window, and I woke him up and I startled him up. And he said, what is it? What is it? What is it? I said, are you a taxi? He said, yes. I said, it doesn't look too busy here tonight. He said, no, not too busy. So I took out a $20 bill, Brother Grisham. I said, here's $20. I'm bored, and obviously you're bored. I want you to ride me around as long as this $20 will last. And folks, we visited schools. We went to Kmart. We, we, looked, we went down to the pier and looked at the two ships that was docked down there. We got a, a thorough explanation. I got a thorough explanation of why most of the stuff was closed down. I got a view of the downtown from the end of a street uh, west and the end of a street east. And then he took me up and showed me the same downtown from top to hill. And finally we're moving around and I said, why don't you just take me back to the hotel? He took me back toward the hotel and I'm getting out of the car and he said, you got $5 left. And that's the way this world is, folks. It'll just drive you around and drive you around and drive you around and drive you around. But there's not all that much to see. There's not all that much to do. But in Christ, there is life, there is hope, and there is eternity in Christ. I don't know if you're looking for anything else, but I've found all I need in Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. But, but, you see, here's the thing. It's so easy to shout about all of this. It's so easy to talk about all of this and then not really respond to the fact that Christ is the only answer. We're filled with the Holy Ghost, folks. We're not just ordinary people. We're extraordinary, Holy Ghost-empowered people that know the answer and understand what it takes to be saved. And Christ has told us, I wonder if there's anybody here that believes what he said, that he was the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other name. There's no other way. There's no other solution. And I know that many of us say we believe this, but I really wonder, have we made the kind of decisions that reflect the fact that we understand that it's all in Jesus Christ? Many of us maybe are like the Beatles described years ago in their song, Nowhere Man. They said, I am a nowhere man living in a nowhere land, making all his plans for nowhere. See, it's possible to come to a camp meeting like this or to go to your church every Sunday night and be a nowhere man. You hear messages about Jesus Christ. You hear the preacher say that there are no options, that there are no alternatives. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. But you make no plans to adjust your life to that truth. You make no plans to organize your mind to that truth. 
if Christ is the way, the only way, if he's life, all the life there is, if he's the hope, all the hope there is, then we should look to no other. We should believe in no other. We should have no energy or talents given to anything else. This is what it takes. This is the bottom line. This is the truth. Clap your hands to the Lord. Jesus said, I'm going to force you into the decision. You've got to make a decision. You've got to, do, you've got to figure out what you're going to do about me. My daughter, she's a wonderful kid, 17 years old, serving now in Spain for the summer, working with one of our missionaries there, brother and sister Sharp. We miss her so much. I wish she was here. So you'll forgive me for preaching a little bit about her tonight because it's kind of on my mind. And last summer, we... Uh, we uh, was in the Smoky Mountains, and uh, uh, Sister Mooney wanted to just snore uh, for a day, and Jay and I got up and was looking at the brochure. <laughs> Excuse me, just had to take care of a little family problem there. <laughs> Preachers spend so much time in the pulpit, sometimes we have to fix things up. <laughs> wherever we can. So we was looking at a little brochure, and you know, uh, I'm kind of like you, Brother Grisham, you know, Jay was uh, come along a little, a little late in life, but not quite as late as your kid. But you know, we old men, we don't want to act old, right? Even though we are old and can't hardly walk half the time. I've seen you play that game a few times. And so Jay's looking at the brochures. I said, honey, we'll spend the day together. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, you pick it. You just look around. Whatever there is to do here in the great Smoky Mountains, we'll do it. Whatever. And she says, daddy, this looks good. Let's do this. I said, what is it? And she handed me the brochure, white water rafting. <laughs> okay. Sure, kid. Let's go. So we called and made reservations. Now, I knew it was going to be a bad day when I found out I had to get up at 4 a.m. to go. There's not many things worth doing at 4 a.m. in the morning. One man said he thought if God wanted us to see the sunrise, he wouldn't have made it so early in the morning. So we go. It's raining. We're going out. White water rafting. Not to be outdone. I'm the all-American father, right? I'm the great adventurer. That's right, kid. I can do it if you can do it. And so we go to this little place out where we're going to whitewater raft and it's pouring down raining and I thought well this is good you can't go rafting in the rain right the man comes out and said glad you're here now don't worry about the rain ladies and gentlemen because what we're going to do it doesn't matter you're going to get wet anyway well that solved that issue there didn't it so he said now we're going to go to class because you can't just whitewater raft without going to the class and so we went into the classes just stay with me a little while now and uh, we're sitting there and we're in the class and uh, he's talking about the river he said now the first thing I want to tell you about this river is that there's no one that can turn it off That'd be a good thing for all these Pentecostals to know. Now, you may not like what's happening in this world. You may not like the drugs. You may not like the alcoholics. You may not like the onslaught of promiscuousness and adultery. But there's no way that this world is going to stop, ladies and gentlemen. Nobody has a magic button. Nobody can turn off the river. And then he looked at us and he said, I want to tell you, this is not Disneyland. You can't turn off the river. So you've got to figure out a way to survive. That's what Jesus Christ was trying to tell us. He said, look, there are no other options. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You've got a little, you've got just a little thing called life. And in this life, you've got to decide what you're going to do with Jesus Christ. It's not going to be if somebody puts a gun to your head, but it's got to happen way down inside your heart. You've got to make a decision about Christ. Because if you say yes to Christ, you shall live. But if you turn your back on Christ, ye shall die in your sins. Can I get a witness? Does anybody believe what I'm preaching here? You can't turn the river off. 
So I'm sitting there. I'm a smart aleck father. I said, I know that. You can't turn the river off. Big deal. He said, now, there are several levels of whitewater rafting. He said, it goes from one to six. The river you're going to be on today is a four. That's two notches from the top. He said, is there anybody here that has not ever whitewater rafted before? And there were several smart aleck teenagers that was going, oh yeah, we've done this before. And there was one old fat man <laughs> that sheepishly raised his hand and said, I've never done this before. And he looked at me and said, you may have a little problem with this, sir. He made me mad when he said that. I said, Jay, I'm not going to have a problem with this. He said, now when we get on the river, remember, I can't turn it off. Listen to what I'm saying. If you get in trouble, there's no way we can turn off the river. You've got to understand what's happening to you here. So pay attention. He said, now there's a possibility that somebody will fall out of the raft. And I poked my little daughter and I said, not me. I'm not falling out of the raft. You understand? Now, the instructor was a smart aleck. He saw me poke my daughter, and he said, Now, some of you may think you'll not fall out of the raft. He said, But let me tell you, it's usually the fat guys that fall out of the raft. He said, It's heavy people that get to bouncing on the side of those things. And I thought, this devil, I'm going to show him I am not falling out of this raft. He said, but if you should fall out, of course, my little daughter, she's falling in the floor. You know, she's thinking this is so funny. I said, honey, do you really want to do this? I said, we're going to get cold today, you know. But she's insisting. He said, now, here is the secret. When you fall out of the boat, just in case, you've got to know what, you, what you're doing here. He said, when you fall out of the boat, he said, there's an oar. And at the end of the oar is a little T-top. And he said, if you're within five feet of the raft, he said, just put the end of the oar down there and grab a hold of the T-top and we'll pull you back to the raft. When we get you back to the raft, we'll grab the top of your lifesaver jacket and pull you in the boat. So that's the way it will work. That's if you're within five feet of the raft. He said, now if you should go... Uh, from five feet to about 25 feet he said you're in a little trouble there remember you can't turn the river off you understand that he said there's a little rope in the boat and you take the rope and said we'll throw the rope out to you do not fight the rope grab hold of the rope hang on we'll pull you back to the raft and grab a hold of your life jacket and pull you into the boat. Does everybody understand? Yes, we all understand. He said, now if you should go past 25 feet. He said, you are on. On your own. And something started clicking inside of me. I said, now ain't this just like the world? They'll help you up to a degree. They'll go along with you up to a degree, but there is a place, ladies and gentlemen, when you get past the influence and the help of this world. That's what Jesus was talking about. There is a thing called eternity. No man can take you there. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one Redeemer. Only Jesus can save your soul. And it doesn't take you too long to get past the place where the world can help you or where the world is willing to help you. Now he said something else, which is what I want to preach to you about tonight. He said there's one other thing that you must remember on this trip. It's either paddle or die. Paddle or die. If you 
do not put your paddle in the water. If you sit on that raft and act like you don't know what's going on, you are going to be in trouble. You've got to look down that river, he said. You've got to make decisions. You've got to anticipate the rocky shores. You've got to anticipate the white water. You've got to anticipate the waterfalls. You've got to anticipate what's coming. You've got to be prepared to put your paddle in the water. When he said that, something began to turn over inside of me and I said, Jesus, I needed to come and do this today. I needed to hear somebody tell me all over again what is at stake here. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a great fight. We're on a fast river called life and there is absolutely nothing this world can do to take us from here to glory. There is no rapture power in the church or in the world. It's all in the name of Jesus. There is no hope in this world. I wish I had a witness tonight. There is no hope in this world. Listen to me. The drugs can't satisfy. The pleasure can't satisfy. The alcohol can't satisfy. Nothing can give us life but Christ. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. If we could get, you know, our whole world's at a crisis. You do know that. We're at a crossroads. We're at a very serious juncture here. We've got to get Patty Pentecostals to understand that it's time to put your paddle in the water. It's time for you to respond to what you know about Jesus Christ. If you know that he's the Lord, then make him the Lord of your life. If you know he's the Savior, tell it wherever you go. Somebody say one Lord. Somebody say one faith. Somebody say one baptism. Slap the person beside you and say paddle or die. You believe this? You believe this? Well, you can't just sit in the raft. You can't just step there. We can't turn this river off. Do you understand that? This is a mean old world. You've got to paddle, sir. You've got to think about what you're doing. You've got to recognize Christ as the great I am, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He came to rescue us. He came to save us. He came to give us eternal life. Somebody help me paddle. Paddle or die. Clap your hands one more time to the Lord. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. You understand what I'm talking to you about? Too many folks playing church, as you know. Paddle or die. Says so you got to look down that river, and you've got to see the rocks. You've got to decide way up the river what you're going to do about some of the things you're going to face. You can't play around with this river. Nobody can turn it off. You've got to get that paddle in the water. Everybody in the raft has got to participate in the ride. You know, there's nothing worse than having somebody in your raft that won't paddle. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Nothing worse than having somebody in the choir that won't get their part. Where's the choir director at? Huh? Where's the choir? Stand up choir director. Nothing worse than having a bunch of folks that didn't come to choir practice standing up there going watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. They don't know what the words are. They don't know what the song is. They don't understand what the purpose is. We've got to have folks in the church that understand this is life and death, heaven or hell. We're not playing a game here. We're trying to get ready for the great getting up morning. Come on, you PC, paddle or die. This world is going to hell. Either get with it or get out of the raft. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. We had, 
we had, we had a dingbat from Tennessee, no reflection. We got down to the water getting ready to launch the raft and the lady says, oh, the water's cold. I wanted to say, lady, you just spent $44. To get into this raft, you should have known the water was going to be cold. And I wanted to just take her and push her in. <laughs> Some of you folks, let me remind you. When you made a commitment to Jesus Christ, when you said, I believe with all of my heart, you was responding to the only message that can save you. Now you stick your little toe in that water and you forget about whether it's cold or hot and you plunge in and get in that raft and stay in the boat and stay in the church and keep the faith, baby, until we get over on the other side. And her husband looked at her and said, for heaven's sake, woman, get in the boat. That's what I want to do to some of these Christians. For heaven's sake, get in the boat. Paddle or die. Come on, get with it. You Sunday school teachers, it's not a game. Paddle or die. Come on, preachers. It's not just a career. It's not a profession. Paddle or die. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, who is above all, through all, in you all. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Paddle! My, my, clap your hands one more time. understand what I'm preaching about out of that boat he said I'd recommend you lock your foot in there now I didn't pay real close attention to that <laughs> until we got on the river we finally got that not from Tennessee in the boat. <laughs> they got nuts in Louisiana too, you know. I heard about yeah, it. Yeah, you heard about it. You know some of them. Just, uh, yes, they're I They're trying do. to be cool. Yeah. With all this. <laughs> got out there on that river, hit the first little wave. Wasn't much of a wave, but it was enough to make me know that the man wasn't kidding about the fat thing. I started bouncing. You know the next thing I did? I reared back, ladies and gentlemen, and locked my foot in that little rubber thing right there. And I said, nothing is gonna, nothing is gonna separate me from this little band. Nothing is gonna take my foot out of this little lock right here. I said to JJ, I don't care if this thing turns over. When they turn it back up, I'm gonna be holding on to the raft. You know what Jay said to me? She said, oh, dad, paddle or die. Do you understand what I'm preaching about? You better get your feet in the word of God. You better get your heart committed to Jesus Christ. You better get a death grip on this whole ark. And you better hold on through the flood, through the difficulty, through the trial, through the test. the person beside you and say nobody can turn off the river <laughs> 20 million people affected with the HIV virus right now in the world and nobody can turn off the river a hundred thousand people in America died last year last year 
from alcohol-related difficulties. And nobody can turn off the river. 350,000 people died from drugs and all its related problems. And nobody can turn off the river. You ever been inside a crack house, ladies and gentlemen, a dark, dingy place filled with trash and garbage and filth and plastic bags and people either coming or going on some kind of cocaine-induced trip? It's a horrible scene, ladies and gentlemen, and some people got so much junk in their veins, they would love for somebody to turn off the river. They'd love for somebody to get them out of the tangle and the mix-up of life, but there's no help outside of the name of Jesus Christ. The judges don't know what to do. The police don't know what to do. Ah, the government doesn't doesn't know what to do but there is a savior who died on the cross and if this hungry world will come to Jesus he can satisfy your soul somebody say paddle, paddle. or die I'll tell you about this nut from Tennessee she sat in the boat and squealed and hollered she was up in one of the key places in the boat. I was trying to act like a nice guy before I realized what a four was all about. Brother Tenney, after I figured out what a four was all about, I realized that this was no time to be nice. I said to the little nitwit from Tennessee, I said, honey, you get over here and let me have that front position because I don't want to go into the brink. You understand, I got a little 16-year-old daughter that's going to laugh at me for the next 45 years. Get out of my way. She said, you don't have to be so nasty about it. I said, well, you heard what the man said, paddle or die. And we'd hit three or four rocks and we was all messed up. And somewhere along the way, somebody's got to find the courage. Does anybody know what I'm fixing to say? Somebody's got to find the courage to say to all the deadbeats and the nitwits and the folks that won't pay their tithes and the folks that won't sing in the choir and the folks that won't drive a bus. What's your name, sir? Mark. Mark, I'm going to tell you something. We got drug addicts, alcohols. We got young people that are biblically illiterate. This is not a theater. This is not a game. It's paddle or die, sir. Do you understand? Yes, sir. You get here in the front of this wrath, and you get you a paddle. Somebody give me a paddle. My goodness. Mmm. Hallelujah. And this is a heavy paddle mark, and I don't want you to make any smart remarks about it. You ought to just be glad you're in the boat. You ought to just be glad you got a paddle. Paddle or die, you understand? Don't mess around, that's it. Does anybody know what I'm preaching about? Come on, church, we've, we've played patty cake for too long. The people that don't want to do right, they don't want to live right, they don't want to think right, but I got a little message for you tonight. Paddle! I'm a living witness, sir, that a fat man can stay in the boat. You remember what I told you? Yes, sir. What did I tell you? That fat man. No. How can a fat man stay in the boat? If he paddles. Mm, see, you're not paying attention. Mm, gotta take you back to class for a little while. Come on, Brother Kilgore. Got a boy here miss Sunday school class, you understand? Lay hands on him and tell him to hook his foot under that little strap and hold on. You understand what we're talking about? You can't paddle unless you're in the boat. Now that's a revelation, isn't it? You understand? If you're paddling outside of the boat. You won't go anywhere. Yeah, very good. Very good. You're on your own. That's why you gotta hook your foot in there. That's why you gotta hang on. That's why you gotta grab you a paddle. Oh yeah, there you go. Hallelujah. Somebody give the boy a paddle. Hallelujah. Somebody tell him paddle or die. You understand what I'm talking about? Are you afraid to be a Jesus name, one God person? No, paddle or die. There's no other way. There's no other life. There's no other name. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Paddle or die!
Some of you folks want to get in these charismatic yachts. But we went up that, down that stream and up that stream all day long. Over the rocks, over the mountains. I didn't see one yacht. Didn't Jesus tell you there was a broad way that leads to destruction and many there be on that way. But there was another way called a narrow way. It's a holy way. It's a righteous way. And few there be that find it. And if you know that he is the one Lord, if you know that he's the everlasting father, I got a little word for you tonight. Paddle! Paddle! Don't get tired on me over there. Mm. Oh, Shane, poor Shane. No, it's not poor Shane. It's be glad, Shane, that the Lord chose you. Got some guys over here that are getting tired. You get in there and man the back of the boat. That's an important position back there, Shane. Now you're in the back of the boat. You don't have time for clean exit. Get back there. You got to pay attention, Shane. You got to look down the river. You got to make sure you're kind of guiding this thing, you see? You got to learn how to lean, Shane. You got to learn how to sink. You got to learn how to pray. You got to learn how to fast. You got to learn how to hold on. Because there ain't no tomorrow and nobody can turn off the river. And this world needs somebody that knows something about Jesus. I'm out of time. I, I'm going to quit. I'm, here. No, no. Paddle or die, Bishop. Paddle or die. You ever felt like that? Battle or die. There's no turning back. Now, let me just skip ahead to this. Y'all be seated for just a while. Uh, hello, hello. The man in the back doesn't even have an oar. You know what the oar is, don't you? I don't have time to develop all this, but it's the apostolic doctrine. Acts 2.38, you got to keep that oar in the water. Because it guides everything, you understand? Huh? These bus people up here and these Sunday school people are depending on you to keep your oar in the water. Because you got to keep them on target. You got to keep them in line with the apostolic doctrine. You see those? See that rock down there? You gotta start making a decision now to move the other side of that rock. That's it. That's it. Get it over there. You can't wait till you get there. Now, try to grasp this. That's why Jesus gave you the bottom line concept. In a sense, he gave you the bottom line target so you could line up your little, your little uh, survey thing to the bottom line. The bottom line is in Christ alone is their salvation. You got to line up with that. Everything has got to line up with Acts 2.38 with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me just give ahead to this. There was a... <laughs> Are you boys tired? Huh? A little bit, huh? It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Help me. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. Just when you get tired, just sing that song, all right? And you don't have to be on key. Don't try to sing like Mickey Mangan. You ain't going to make it. I want to tell you that. And just hold on to that now. We uh, was going down the river. Now, I found this true. You, this is just me now. I have to preach off the editorial page for just a minute. But the guy that was running this thing, we had people in the water. We had people that didn't keep their foot locked up underneath that thing. We had, we had to stop for people that busted their heads. We had to stop for people that lost. We threw ropes and lifesavers. One time I even had to wade out and rescue some girl and some boy that had busted their lips with the oars. There's people like that in the church. Pay attention now. Oars are for rowing, not busting one another in the head. (laughs) 
But then we got on down the river and we came to a waterfall and it was about a six to seven foot drop. And the guy said, all right, everybody eddy up. And we eddied up in a little pond. We're eddied up now. You can stop rowing. We rested for a little while. God does that, you know, gives you little eddies along the way. Nothing changes, though. The river's still running. It's just a little quiet place like a camp meeting where you can take a few nights off, you understand? And then it's right back in the fight. So we eddied up for a little while. He said, now, folks, this is the last plunge. He said, this is a five-foot drop, maybe uh, somewhere between a five and seven-foot drop. And he took us up on a little ridge and he said, I want everybody to look at this drop. So we all walked up there and we looked out over the river and the river was flowing. And it came and it went. And there was two big boulders and he had to go through the two boulders and take the drop. And he said, now, is there anybody that would like to go back to the bus Now, there's been times, Brother Ronnie Gidrose, that the Lord just kind of said, I don't want to talk to you here. Just let your little raft rest there for a while. We're going to go up in a little ledge over here. And uh, I know I'm preaching too long, but you just have to bear with me. And, uh, let's just kneel down here, Brother Ron. I know how you feel. Get up, get up here where you can see. Your ministry's just kind of been floating along here for a while, you know. And uh, you done good. You've been paddling, pretty good. But uh, it's a home stretch now, son. And had a couple big boulders up there, and you see that? That's about a seven foot drop. I don't want to make you a deal. You can either ride this river with me or you can go back to the bus. But if you go back to the bus, you're not going to wear the crown and you need a crown real bad. Here's the secret. It's paddle or die. Do you understand that? And if you will keep your foot hung, hooked under that little band and keep your paddle in the water and bear to the right, keep bearing to the right, do you understand? You can make it over that plunge. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, stay right here because your wife is mad at me. I don't want to take you back down. I don't mean to use you in my sermon, but I'm sure there's been many times in your life when the Lord has said, do you want to take this plunge? But think about this, folks. Why go back to the bus? We've come too far. I said, Jay, how do you feel about it? She said, let's go for it. And I said, okay. Oh, and we got back in that raft. And we got out of the eddy and we began to paddle again. Very good, nice thinking. And we began to paddle and began to paddle. To the right, to the right, bear to the right, bear to the right. Keep your eyes on the water. And ladies and gentlemen, the stream began to pick us up. And we began to go and flow to the right, to the right. And everybody in the raft began to work together. Even the old nag from Tennessee got her paddle in the water. And we began to work. And we, to the right, to the right, to the right. We made it past the rock. We took the plunge. Now when we got back... To the little place when we were in the little shop there when we when we first came in they had these t-shirts that you could buy they even had my size double x <laughs> and the t-shirt said
paddle or die. I had no interest at all in the 1595 t-shirt. But after I had rowed the river for five and a half hours, I couldn't hardly walk when I got out of that raft. I was freezing to death. I staggered up to that little gift shack. And I said, give me one of those t-shirts. One of these days, one of these days, you're going to step out over on the other side. And you're going to say, Lord, I'm ready. And he's going to put those robes around your body. And he's going to say, you made it. You fought a good fight. You kept the faith. Clap your hands to the Lord. to the Lord. You know what we Pentecostals need to be saying to one another? Brother Grisham, don't be discouraged. Keep on paddling, sir. Keep on preaching. There's no place to go. There's none of a name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Paddle or die. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Paddle or die. Are there any believers in the house? Oh, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Oh, give me that old time religion. Give me that old. It's good enough for me. Well, it will take us all to heaven. It will take us all to heaven. It will take us all to heaven. It's good enough for me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Say this to somebody, I can't drift. Say it again, I can't drift. When you get to church on Sunday night, you can't drift. If you've got a ministry, if you've got a church, you can't drift. You gotta get the paddle in the water. You gotta do something. You gotta make a decision. You got to make some choices. And it's all predicated on one thing. There's no other name. There's no place else to go. He is the bottom line. There's no choice. There's no options. There is no other name. There's no other way. Everything you do ought to be predicated on that one central theme. Where can I go? The apostle said. Thou only hast the words of eternal life. You know what I'd like to see us do all over this place tonight? Balcony up here in the front. I'd like for us to gather in the aisles in the front of the church. I'd like for us to raise our hands toward heaven. It's paddle or die night in Louisiana. Let's recommit ourselves to this old-fashioned oneness message. Let's commit ourselves again to this old-fashioned apostolic message. It's paddle or die. Give me that old time religion. Come on. It's good enough. Come on, let's get around here.
preachers right now. Do you know what your preacher's trying to do? He's trying to keep you in the raft. He's trying to keep you with your paddle in the water because there's no place to go. If you take the bus, you go back to nowhere. If you leave Christ, you go back to being what you were apart from Christ, dead in your trespasses and sin. Let's pray that God will give new strength to our preachers as they pray for one another. Come on, Louisiana. Pray for your preachers. Pray for your pastors. Oh, God, touch us. Oh, God, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Thank you, preacher, for preaching to me. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for encouraging me. Thank you for challenging me. Thank you for keeping me on fire. Thank you for keeping my eyes on the target. Thank you for keeping my faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, God, give strength to our pastors. Give healing to our pastors. Give renewal to our churches. Give new power to our churches.